Getting started with a home studio is easy, but as you progress, what and where should you look to improve? Today on this episode of Launch Your Live, we're going to interview Junaid Ahmed, who's taken his journey, and we're going to discuss with him some different ways that you can use to improve your home studio. You know, I have to say, I was amazed, Jim. I was checking out Junaid's studio before the show, and it's pretty awesome, right? Yeah, uh, I've had I've had an opportunity to talk with Junaid a couple times, and that's why I was excited for us to get him on uh, Launcher Live because he really uh, is an expert at home studio work. And when you see what he's doing, you're really going to enjoy uh, seeing some of the ideas and things that he's going to give us to uh, improve our home studios. And something that I'm slowly in the process of because it's not free unless you've just got some ways to do it free that's a, gr a great point by the way you know it, it's definitely not a free process it's something that it does take time to do you know and you also have to plan it out it's not just i'm gonna slap a whole bunch of stuff together and now i have this home studio you do need to think about the equipment the lighting the space that you're working in you know the background what you think your show could be. Don't just plan for today, plan for tomorrow. And so I'm excited to bring Junaid on. And by the way, just a quick uh, note, he is also the host of the Hack and Hobbies podcast as well as an Amazon live show of the same name. So uh, Junaid, thanks a lot for joining Jim and I for episode 54 of the Launch Your Live podcast. Absolutely. I'm super excited to be here, guys. Thank you so much. So... I want to kick things off. You know, how did you get started with live streaming? And this is a question we always ask our guests because everybody tends to have a bit of a different journey, but there's always usually, you know, a similar path that everyone takes. You know, I've been infatuated by live streaming for some years now, and I've done some kind of live streaming through virtual reality or just on your smartphone. But it didn't, it all came together exactly 365 days ago when Pat Flynn, well, it's been more than 365 days, when Pat Flynn started streaming live every day on Amazon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> totally screwed that up. On YouTube. So he, he's, he streamed live on YouTube for 365 days uh, on March 16th or 15th. And when he started, I was like, oh my God, this looks so good. And he's one of the guys that inspired me as well. So I kept watching, I kept watching, I kept watching. And then I think after 10 days, he put out a blog post out that late that basically showed you exactly what he's doing in his studio. And I was like, okay, I've got all this gear already because as a filmmaker, as somebody who's shot short films, uh, been around Hollywood sets and whatnot. I was like, this is pretty easy. So I, I began my journey and I was like, hey, I want to do live streaming because it's cool. And I want to tell my story, my uh, story about podcasting, story about teaching people how to use their smartphones better. So going further back in 2018, when LinkedIn and everybody put, was posting videos on LinkedIn and we're doing LinkedIn Lives. Um, we were also doing LinkedIn Locals. So I showed up at one of this LinkedIn local event with my little gimbal and my smartphone. And I was walking around shooting video. And the host who had organized the event, Rod Ferrier, he noticed me and he's like, this guy's on onto something. So later on, he reached out to me. He's like, hey, how about you teach people how to use their smartphones for video production. I'm like, sure, absolutely. Uh, so I, I created this. He basically put me on a path to then create a, you know, talk about it in person. I don't want to take too much, too much time, but talk about it in person. And then I created a little, little pamphlet, little ebook of sorts. Now I wanted to create a video course. And when I started, when I wanted to create the video course, I put up the camera in my office and all I see was yellow walls. And 
I was like, this, something's got to give. So anyways, long, long story short, that's, that's basically what got me inspired and got me going to create my studio. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's so interesting hearing everyone's journey and, you know, I like how you allowed others to inspire you as well, because, you know, a lot of people, they, they go into this and they, you know, they just, they don't really, let's see. Um, well, what a lot of people do is, you know, they get into live streaming and they, they think it's, you know, they take it just to a hobby level, you know, they start using it and, but they really don't go in with a purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. But I liked how, like, you know, you were actually experimenting it and seeing how easy it actually can be. And a lot of people, when they look at technology, they think technology is really difficult to use a lot of times, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there is a lot of planning, I know, that goes into this. Um, for example, you mentioned having piles of gear. I can totally relate to you. I've got gear laying around that I'm like, you know, it's just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's like I need to incorporate it into my overall plan. So, Jim, uh, what are the questions we have for Junaid? Yeah, well, first of all, it's kind of funny, Junaid, that you said you started with a yellow wall because my first uh, place I live stream, my old house, had yellow walls. And the walls I'm looking to improve here and the wall behind me I'm covering are yellow. So maybe that's a common theme. But uh, why did you create a home studio? And uh, what made you really feel like I got to have a home studio? And that became part of your journey. That's an excellent question. So as we were all working from home last year, I was like, hey, this is going to be something that we're going to be doing for a while because what we have here is not going away. It's a lifestyle that has come to a realization that, hey, it's easy. It takes me five minutes to get to my office. <laughs> what, what I want to get in the car. So what really inspired me to create this space was, number one, I was working from home and I was I got lucky. Um, I started a month early before everybody else was, you know, that the in they had the lockdown was issued and I started working from home. And and because I had this grand plan from coming into for two years, I'm like, hey, I got I need to have a space. And for that, what I had done is I went and bought the vinyl wall and it looked really nice on the page on the website when I when I actually got it. It was kind of washed out. And I was like, you know what? Let me just still go ahead and, and go with the plan. So I put it up in my room uh, in the basement. It's an open space. I set up the lights. I set up the cameras. I set up the microphone, everything. It took me about an hour and a half to two hours and my kids come running like, hey, dad, we're hungry. What's going on? Get some food on us. Or they either want to go out and play because or I need to put them to bed. There's so many different things that come into play when you have to set something up. And it takes time, right? I didn't pay I didn't pay attention to how much time it takes when when I was going on sets and creating, you know, short films. I had a team of people. I had another crew member, you know, I had crew members. So multiple people putting stuff together, it's much faster to do than you're doing it yourself. So I didn't account for all of that extra time that I was saving with the crew. But at home, I'm just my own crew. Like I'm my own person. So it took me a lot more time. So that was the other reason that why I wanted a full setup studio. Sorry, I can't schedule commands. That's okay. <laughs> Right, Siri can't schedule commands at this moment, but that's coming soon. So, <laughs> so that's what inspired me to, you know, create a space for myself, not only to show up live, not only to be able to, because we're sitting in front of our computers with those Zoom calls that we've been doing, uh, but only also be to be able to create content on the fly. Hey, I want to record this video. I've got the setup. I don't need to do the setup. Now I can just focus on the script. I can focus on what I'm going to be talking about. The beautiful thing of having a space, even though it took me about three to four months having experience shooting smart short films and documentaries, having that experience, it took me four months to set up the camera. Now, when I talk about this experience, 
I've mainly been behind the camera. I just have to worry about the technology. I just have to worry about the set. The person who's going in front of the camera, they've had years of experience of being in front of the camera. So it took me about six to seven months to get comfortable, to be comfortable in front of a camera. And that's the hardest thing. So if anybody's thinking about starting a live, I tell them, hey, just use whatever you have. Just get started because that experience that you're going to build, you can't buy that in the shop because we can go buy we can go buy stuff out of shop and it's going to take us time to set it up. But the experience that you gain and build is talking in front of the camera. It's a really good point, you know. And one thing I want to talk about, you know, in terms of setting up a home studio, I want to talk budget because you know you mentioned you know you should use just you should use what you have at least if you're getting started, you know, and I know like Jim, you and I always talk about leveling up. So you start with like that webcam that's built into your laptop, you know, maybe you've added a little more light to it. Um, then we moved up to the external webcam and then we moved up to some of the mirrorless DSLRs. I, I know there's, there are many more options beyond that. Um, but in terms of a st home studio budget, what, what is an ideal budget or is there, is there an ideal budget? You know, there's not really a budget. It budget it all comes down to, hey, what's this show going to be about? Is it more? Are you mostly doing a talking heads type of type of situation, or are you doing something that's going to be, uh, you know, more interactive? So you can you can start with a webcam, absolutely. But the image quality and the audio quality, I start with the lighting and I start with the audio because yeah. You can get the sound across to the people watching and listening to you. They're going to know what your message is. So, and that's why we tolerate videos that if somebody's recording a video on their smartphones, we'll tolerate it if the, the audio is good, the message is good, or we know the person. Like we're I'm talking, you know, you got to also think about warm audience versus cold audience. If you're, if you're looking to get more cold audience, you got to have that good setup. But if you already have warm audience, hot audience, you love Jim, you know, you you love Kristen, you you love Tony and, uh, you know, whoever is the person that's your friend, you're going to watch them no matter what camera they're shooting in. Mm -hmm. So it's all about, you know, what what type of audience are we trying to, you know, bring into our world? It's a really good point. And do you when you go into this, um, do you think that like when people are going to set up their home studio, um, should they um is it a personal budget? Is it like saying, Hey, you know what? I like, did you go into this thinking, for example, okay, I'm going to like, did you go in there, I guess, thinking from a monetization standpoint that you're going to actually monetize right off the bat? Or did you just start doing this uh, because you wanted to learn it? Like, should people think, I guess what I'm getting at is should people think, you know, like I'm going to, they need to know how to monetize this to begin with, or should that kind of be like a little bit down the road and then they kind of build their budget around that? You know, the monetization is a good question, and I never really thought about it. Like, oh, can I monetize? I, I, I don't have no idea. Can I monetize off of this or not? I just went into that, hey, I want to create this because I really like, I really want to look good on camera, right? So it was kind of like a passion. It was kind of like something that um, uh, really inspired me and enabled me to, like, go in like have a setup that made sense to me. So does monetization come into the play? Well, absolutely. People will also talk, will always want to learn, hey, how can I monetize? I get questions all the time. Hey, Junaid, I want to launch a YouTube channel so I can monetize and it's going to be about this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, how passionate are you really about what you want to talk about? Uh, not really but I want to make money. Like, yes, everybody may want to make money, mm -hmm. but to build this kind of money, you really got to put it, put in the time. People who've had YouTube channels or, you know, a presence online for five, 10 years, they've built up that muscle. They've built up an audience. They yeah. can then monetize off of it. Just to start off the bat, you got to put in a lot of money before you start making money. And, and that's true of any business. I mean, you've got to put in the, and, and I like, by the way, how you said you've got to put in the time mm -hmm. versus you've got to necessarily put in the equipment, for example. Um, 
And speaking of equipment, by the way, I know you have, we, we talked about using the built-in webcam. Um, I know you can get the external webcam. Um, I know that there's some really good smartphone apps that turn your smartphone into a webcam. Yeah. Um, what kind of cameras though do you use? Like maybe tell us what you started with and sure. what you currently use. So what I started with was a cheapy webcam, external webcam, because um, I have an external monitor that doesn't have a webcam. So I bought this Microsoft Live Cam back in 2012 or 2013. And so this was a you know plain 720p HD uh, webcam. The problem is um, it doesn't have a lot of control over the exposure trifecta, which mm -hmm. is like what, what are you talking about exposure tri triangle or trifecta you know you have the the sensor the sensor that's on the camera how sensitive is this do you have control over the aperture and do you have control over, over the shutter speed webcams don't have any of that they just stick a camera has some kind of mirror in front of it or uh, a glass in front of it and that's that's all you get everything else that they control is all through software so that's the camera that I started. And if you watch some of the videos from my initial Zoom calls for my podcast, the video quality looks horrible, right? I was like, I'm not recording video. It's just a podcast, <laughs> right? Um, and then I moved up to the top, le top level because I already had the gear. I'm like, oh, what? Canon launched this utility to be able to convert my DSLR into a webcam, hook me up. So that's the first thing I went directly into. I just plugged in my DSLR, put it on a side angle, use the USB to bring in the feed into the computer, and I was good to go. But then later on, yeah. I also learned that, you know, you can, you can convert your smartphone as a webcam. It has a better camera. It's got more elements inside that lens as opposed to a webcam so it's able to focus better it's able to uh, give you better clarity of image so what kind of um what kind of camera are you using right now what, what cameras are you using i guess sure so i'm using a full frame mirrorless camera by canon the eos eos r okay nice it was the first mirrorless camera that Canon put out. I know Sony's been uh, in that game for a while, and I did. I didn't want to go to a a short format or a, a crop sensor because uh, Canon has had crop sensor mirrorless cameras for a while. Yeah, M one hundred, M two hundred, all the M series. I didn't want to go to that because I've had of a. I've had a mirrorless, uh, sorry, a DSLR camera that was a crop sensor, and I want, always wanted to go to the full frame. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting the EOS R, having the gear already, the lenses. I was like, hey, I can use all these lenses with this camera. Yeah. So that's what I'm running as my main camera. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And I, I like how you talk about the lenses because the lenses are important. You mm -hmm. know, when, if, for example, I, because uh, I, um, I also have a Canon uh, crop sensor as well. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where I bought what I could afford at the time. Yes. And there, like I was initially like, oh, I'm going to get the Canon, you know, the 5D Mark III, for example, which I think is now the Mark IV. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I was thinking, oh, I'll spend, what was that? Like, I can't remember, was that three, $5,000, something like that. And I was going to get that. And then I, you know, wised up and I said, well, you know what? I've never done this before. Let me just get another camera. And I didn't know, for example, about the crop sensors as much at the time. Technology has been a little bit different. And so I have the camera, but to your point, you know, again, I mean, it's about leveling it up. So uh, I even remember the, the Microsoft Live camera you're talking about as well, um, as you're, that, that brought back some memories, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and the other things like, you know, the frame rates might not have been as good. And so, you know, it's one of those things that you do have to, um, you know, you start with what you have, the webcam, you move up to, you know, the external uh, external webcam mm -hmm. if you want to even skip the dslr model you could just go right to your smartphone nowadays i mean you have literally a thousand dollar device in your hand exactly. that you know for what 50 to 80 dollars maybe i think there's free options yep and you can convert that so what's even cool is these smartphones are so powerful like the iphone 7 plus has been used in feature-length films yeah mm-hmm mm-hmm 
they were using i think uh it was it the movie i think it was orange i think or oranges um i think that was one of the feature link films i know steven soderbergh's used the iphones for feature link films uh a lot of them actually used uh filmic pro actually to do mm -hmm. their filming uh, which is what, like a $15 app that they bought for their phone, which $15 for an app seems really expensive. You think about it like, but it's really not considering people are using that in Hollywood to, to do their shots. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, sorry, I'm geeking out, Jim. I'm sorry. I'm taking over a lot of this conversation. Um, I know you had some questions for Junaid, I think, right? Yeah. So, so Junaid, um, I, and I know you've done it. I mean, you, you can also, for, for those of you that are watching on the uh, YouTube, you can maybe show us some of your different angles. So if you're listening on the podcast deck, make sure to check that out. But what are some other options to enhance your setup, uh, especially with lighting as well? Because I know you've done some different things there in your studio. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the first thing that I focus on is lighting. You know, you, know, you want to get the best light that you can possible and then the, then the best light that you can get for free is a nice big window with a white curtain to soften the light now why do i talk about softening the light you'll notice you can't really see discerning shadows on me because i've softened the light so much that they blend in with the fill light and whatnot so if i switch the angle here I've, you can see a different level of lighting here uh, and this again the background separation and then if I switch over here you can see actually my this light is much higher now which is basically filling in to the rest of the shadow and then my main light is right up here in front of me that's lighting me up so you want to diffuse that light as much as possible and to diffuse light is is similar to if you go outside when it's overcast, you'll notice that there's no shadow or there's very minimal shadow that you can notice because everything is blending in. You want to achieve that blending in by softening that shadow. And um, so that's, you know, that's what that's where I would start. If you don't have the budget for lighting, start with a window and and be to be the window be behind the camera so it's facing you rather than the ca the camera looking at out the window because that's gonna you know deflect or or you know take the attention of your audience away from you to that light source it's it's kind of unnerving so better your lighting by and then lights come in in many different ways for so soften that light have a color controllable light so i have a darker skin so i use a much wider light or you know being more blue or on the spectrum as opposed to being yellow so depending on your complexion you want to see which light makes you more natural to the camera the other thing cool thing about uh, the newer cameras or the external web cameras is that you can tell it to you can set the white balance on them that white balancing will also bring out these natural skin tone of your color to the camera and when you look the same color as you do in person people relate with that and and uh, you know they can then connect with you on a deeper level yeah and and you gotta be careful about washing yourself out and then the other thing mm -hmm. too is even behind you you have uh background lights and i know we've talked about this before you could actually if you wanted to change the colors you can also uh change kind of the way they look as well so I have, i've got a little blue look over here because you know with the flipper remote control i can just change that light color again what color goes well with you you want to you want to again experiment you know there's all all about experimenting you figure out what's going to work for you and you go with that i picked red because it just uh, it's the color of my logo. It's color that, you know, I'm really passionate. So it, it just resounded with me. Plus, red is the strongest color. It has the longest wavelengths. Mm -hmm. So it stands out better and it doesn't affect a whole lot. Like it's not as uh, heavy on your eyes. It's much, it's much um, softer on your eyes. And you'll notice um, if you've ever been to a... Uh, in uh, in a 
sorry, a, a planetarium, they use red lights. Hmm. And, you know, it doesn't affect you being able to look in the sky and look in the dark. It's it's really, it's a much better light to work with. And even in, in a photo, photo, photography rooms, it's mainly red, you know, lit with red color. So it doesn't affect the chemical compounds that are happening, you know, when you're <laughs> trying to uh, develop your uh, photo photographs on film. That's a really good point, you know, and, and I have a couple of questions on this, by the way. And Jim, do you mind if I sort of veer off course a little bit? Sure, go ahead. Uh, so as far as that kind of setup, okay, so I have to say, um, how, like, how much does, from a lighting standpoint, how much does that kind of lighting setup cost? So for example, you've mm -hmm. got the rear, rear lights being controlled by a remote control. How much does that typically run? Um, it's very cheap. To okay. tell you the truth, so I'm, I've got a floodlight set filling in the bottom part, and you'll notice that when I change the color, only the top part change color. So I have LED strip lights, which you can get on Amazon for you know thirty to fifty dollars. Okay. You lay them out how you want them, and okay. then on the bottom, I have a floodlight filling in the rest for another fifteen dollars. So around fifty to seventy-five dollars, you can paint your color. Um, however you want for your background. Very cool. And, and I love the fact that you talked how color, like you can change the color for your brand. Mm -hmm. You can also though change it for, you know, you can change it for the style that you're going for as well. Like yeah. if you're going for that dark, like, you know, that eerie scene, like depending on what your show is about, yeah. for example, you can change it to certain things. Like if you get, if you do the holiday thing and you want to, you know, be festive, you can do that with it. Yeah. Um, you can make it match your brand colors. Um, you can use it to add just a different element than, you know, for example, like my scene, for example, I've got one light in the background, like that's mm -hmm. it, you know? Yeah. And so I like that you have an, a different option that you can do there and you can create something. And it's one of those things also where like the background, for example, is not, it's not crystal clear and it doesn't need to be because it needs, it creates that depth of field, but it also uh, gives off that mystique to where, you know, people don't look at it and say like, well, hey, you know, he's broadcasting at his dining room table or his, you know, his boring bare office. I mean, the scene is what you make it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm like super impressed by this. Um, the other question. So the other, before we move into like the um, the mics and whatnot, um, or, you know, I'll hold it. I'll save this one. Actually, I'm going to save this one for Jem, actually. So I want to talk audio actually with you. Yeah. So I noticed. Um, and by the way, I got to I got to uh, commend you on that excellent uh, camera movement that you did just a second ago when you hit that button to show us the behind the scenes and it wasn't just a static shot it was slowly moving and yeah. that was just fan that was fantastic that was that was well thought out um is that actually a macro or how did you do that so i've got my rear camera actually running on the slider and you'll if okay. you notice if you learn this hard enough uh on yeah. this side over here you'll see the yeah. camera come every once in a while and because it's on a continuous loop. And so okay. every 20, 20 to 24 seconds, it goes back there. And if I switch to that camera here, it's moving back to that spot. And then as I come in here, you'll see it come in. Probably. Right, nice. so it's blocking that part. And then it it just kind of happened that I have the tiles <laughs> laid out that, that kind of blends the camera in yeah. space, yeah. Really awesome. So, um, for to do something like that, how much does that cost? Is that like a, uh, is it a certain type of tripod, a certain type of adapter mount? Uh, what do you, how are you, and how are you moving it? So basically, uh, this guy is sitting on a, uh, forty-two inch slider by Rhino Camera Gear, and uh, you can technically get any slider. So even this guy over here, you'll see it. It's on a, in a little bed, and it's also moving. Uh, a small slider like this where it just adds some kind of movement, like you'll notice this one is going just back and forth, yeah. slightly moving me. Uh, you can any, pick anywhere from $200 to $2,500 you could be spending on a slider. Very cool. This is this is awesome. Sorry, sorry, Jim. I'm just totally geeking out on this because I love this stuff. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I like how you incorporate that. I mean, this makes it, it makes this interview even so much different. I was, I was thinking, Jen, this is a different interview than we normally do. Uh, so I'm really impressed with this. So, okay. So switching gears to audio. So we talked lighting, we talked cameras. 
Uh, let's talk mics. So what kind of mic are you using? Or let's see, what did you start with? And then what are your favorite mics? And then obviously, what are you using? So I started uh, as a podcaster. Okay. And my first, my first season, Hacks and Hobbies, I recorded my episode strictly on my smartphone. So that was my microphone. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And then I plugged in to a wired headset on my episode two and three. And then I had this USB headset that basically connects to your computer. Yeah. And I was like, hey, hey, I can plug into my my phone through the adapter because my first epi my first season was all recorded in my car as I was commuting from work. That's you some know. serious multitasking. I got to say that right, right there. <laughs> That's so weird. I would just hook it up. I was like, hit record, and I start driving, and I start talking, and then you know everything else. You know, you clean it up in the editing floor. But then, as I was going, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna pick up the next uh, microphones. I think the first microphone was the ATR58 or something by mm -hmm. uh, by Audio Technica or Audio Tech, something like that. And that had a USB and an XLR input. And I was like, hey, I don't have any audio gear. And I kept looking at the Scarlet, Scarlet 212, the Scarlet 414. I'm like, I don't have a use for those yet. I'm, I'm not sure that I want to go that high tech yet. So I just stuck with USB, uh, USB uh, microphones. And currently, so after that one kind of stopped working, I was like, maybe I need to replace the cables. None of that worked. So I ended up then getting the blue yeti so you can see in this shot i've got a blue yeti yep. on a little arm over here so it can you know absorb all the bumps and stuff that i have on my desktop so that's the microphone that i'm currently running and the way i have it set up is that it stays out of the shot because i intended to make it that way this way i can create all sorts of content and it's not just a podcast content I can basically do a whole setup. You know, a microphone looks great when you're doing a uh, a podcast. And like, okay, I'm doing a podcast. I need to be as close to the microphone as possible. It works. But I just wanted to be have a multi-function setup. So I ended up going with this. The next upgrade is audio for me. And I've been looking at a lot of uh, – I was watching Jim do a show um, – on Amazon Live to, with uh, on Dealcasters mm -hmm. Christian with Chris, and they were talking about the two and two, the Zoom H, the Zoom H six, and and you know all this audio gear. So I'm doing research right now on what my next upgrade is going to be. So that's where I'm at. Again, it all comes down to where you want to be at when you're creating audio, and where you know how what what you're looking for to create. Fantastic. Yeah. So basically, you know, and I, I remember I, you got me like reminiscing. I was thinking from back in the day, I was using my smartphone and, and I was using a, a H4N, I think it was the Zoom H4N. And I could, it, it had the capabilities to let me plug into an iPhone and run all my audio through that into the phone. Um, so I remember, you know, back in the days of being able to having to cobble together some things to make things work. Um, obviously now, phones don't have a lot of as many of the ports or any of the ports really for the most part and you got to use adapters and all that sort of stuff but um i will say this if you are going to use your smartphone for recording you know whether it's live streaming or a, a podcast you do want to make sure you know don't just use the the open mic on like don't just hold the phone up and like speak into it uh because it sounds great to you but what you're going to hear is it's going to pick up everything around you because of the types of mics that they put in the smartphone yeah um you're going to want to, you know, to minimize that, you're going to want to plug in a headset. That would be the the next step I think I would take. A headset at least with a, a mic plugged, or sorry, with a mic on that headset. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you want to take it a step further, I know you can get things like the iRig, for example, that will then allow you to connect an XLR mic, mm -hmm. kind of like what I'm using here, for example, or what Jem's using. Um, it'll allow you to then plug those in and use them into your smartphones as well. Um, so really awesome. I, I gotta say, and, and I like the fact that, you know, you're talking about leveling up, um, one quick question on that. So at what point do you make the jump from, you know, I used the built-in mic. I then used, you know, a, a, a headset, for example, when do you decide, or when did you decide to say, Hey, you know what? I need to now 
go look at other uh, audio devices? I think it all comes from experience, right? The more time you spend with something and, and the more editing you have to do for, you're just trying to save time. Like I spent a uh, whole bunch of time editing my first or a couple episodes because there was noise. I was like, okay, how can I remove this noise? So you're going to software. Now you're removing noise. You're doing all sorts of things. And then it all comes down to, hey, how can I save time? How can I be more efficient? And the better microphone, the better audio you have from the get-go, the less thing flaggling around you have to do with it. Like mm -hmm. the closer I'm with the microphone, the closer that the higher quality sound that I record from the get-go, the better I will come out at the end. Very good point. So let's move into background. So we talked lighting, we talked cameras, we've talked microphones, you know, and we obviously know that that audio is the most important part of a live stream. Uh, let's talk backgrounds. Yeah, so let's do that. So Junaid, how can a live streamer uh, improve their backgrounds uh, for their live stream? And let's also get into the topic of green screen or not and also uh for those that are watching and maybe you can talk to it let us know about that second wall you have and actually how you went about doing that as you know it's not necessarily what people would think yep absolutely so i thought about go ahead you have a question yep so i thought about um the reason I put this wall up again, this comes back to Pat Flynn. I saw his videos uh, on his video courses and he had this nice wooden background. It's like, okay, that looks pretty cool. And he has like bookshelves next to it. I'm like, okay, all right. So I'm looking at him. I'm looking at other people that, that have that wooden background. It, it kind of gave it that natural look. It's, it's a plain, um, what do you call it? It's, it's an all-purpose kind of setup. Now I do have a workshop that I've also shot videos in where I've you got you can see all my tools in the back. Again, it gives the look of hey, what kind of video am I recording? Does this make sense what I see in the background? Because whatever's in your background is going to relate. Like even if people don't have the audio turned on, you don't have the captions on. As soon as they see what's in the background, they kind of get an idea of what you're talking about. And we'll see that in uh, ads and videos. So I initially wanted to do uh, green screen, but then the more I learned, the more I studied about it, the more I learned about it, the more I stepped away from it because how much detail you need to be. I actually experimented with green screen. Uh, we had um, in 2010 or 20, 2008, we wanted to record some video, a, a talking head that this video was then going to show up in an email. And we, we, I was like, okay, I can do this as a piece of cake. I want, you know, set up a green screen. I set up these shop lights from Home Depot. I set up this whole stage. And then I had the actors sitting in front of the green screen. But again, when I took that video and I tried to key out, there's some green hazing coming into the footage. I'm like, okay, that's not going to work. How can I, you know, do better? So again, it all comes down to the quality of the camera that you're using, the quality of the green screen and the lighting that you have, how taut it is, how far away are you from that green screen? Because again, distance is going to play a key role. Because anytime that green uh, color is coming onto you, you've got you to gotta add distance. You've got to have a ton of distance to be able to play with that green screen. So I was like, okay, that's not going to work. I don't have that in space, space. Let me go over the vinyl background. And then as I talked earlier, the vinyl background that I experienced that I had with was not great, which then pushed me like, okay, it it already kind of soured the taste. I'm like, I'm not going to go buy another vinyl screen to then go from that. So there's multiple things that affected me to go into a physical setup. So... I ended up, first of all, this room was very different when I first started with it. I actually had a large mirror because this was an exercise room. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna use this wall, I'm gonna set it up and you know put this 
uh, vinyl flooring on it. I could have spent more money on the flooring so it wouldn't be shining. Like right now, you can see all the shining and the reflection it does. But it it serves the purpose. It adds that personalization and effect in the way that I wanted it to set up. So again, it depends on the space that you have available. It depends on the budget that you have, the time that you have, the experience that you have. So it all comes down to, okay, how much time, how much energy do you want to put into this? And how much time do you have to uh, experience, sorry, to build in to, you know, go online and, and start talking. And, and Janaid, along those lines, what would you say uh, the, the, if you wanted to put the wood flooring or laminate wood on the wall, is there a specific thickness? And also how did you get that onto the wall? How do you keep it up there? Great question. So this is the interlocking uh, wood flooring. Now you can get them uh, as thick as, you know, they they come in different thickness. You know, they're they're as thick as five millimeters or they're they're seven millimeters. So this is a seven millimeter one. And I also looked at the price. I didn't want to spend too much money. You know, you they can go anywhere from three dollars a square foot to ten dollars a square foot. You want to spend as little as possible. So I think this came up to be a dollar a square foot. So this was the cheapest one. It didn't have any and it had like warning labels. You got it, you need underlayment for this. I'm like I don't need to worry about the honor layman. I'm just putting on a wall. I'm not even going to be walking on it. So I ended up uh, going with this one. And again, they have different color options. So I started with stacking it on from the floor. And since I have a workshop, I had a nail gun uh, in hand. So between the little uh, divots that it connects to each other, you can actually use a nail gun to nail into that divot, plug into your next floor, and then nail again so i just nailed it on the stud and then basically sitting on it's nailed other places that i saw again youtube was king you know i'd learn a ton from youtube some people are putting glue directly onto the wall and when you put glue on the wall when you pull out the floor you're going to take part of the the, <laughs> the 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 wall with you so this way i'm I, if i wanted to take this off i could take it off in a day and it wouldn't affect, you know, my walls will remain the same. I just have to patch it up so all the holes are gone and I can paint a different coat of color. But again, don't want to put that kind of time in. So again, it all comes down to, hey, how much time do I have? How much budget do I have? So I think this wall probably cost me $100 just in materials. And having that nail gun handy kind of helped. And then, you know, watching ton of videos on how to put a wall on the floor or wall, uh, fl what flooring on the wall. <laughs> and all, and also too, you in the background chose to, and, and you're, you're using your camera to kind of create that blur look, but you actually have a bookcase back behind you, yeah. which also kind of helps. It's it, and, and what I love what you're doing, what a lot of live streamers don't think about it's that whole pattern interrupt mm -hmm. by changing things periodically you're you're getting that change and so it catches people's attention it's not always the same view and, and and always the same look yeah like the the side angle was stationary at first but now i've added a slider because guess what i had a slider <laughs> i had a slider a small enough slider lying around that i could just mount it on to the stand that i had the camera on and my producer told me hey Side shot, it's too static. It's like people, it's like somebody's creeping up on you. Uh, you know, if you had a slider on it, it, it would look a lot more interesting. So I was like, hey, guess what? I have a slider. Let me bust it out and put it in. So all of this gear was packed away in boxes because, hey, everybody's staying home. I'm not doing any movie shoots. So now I'm doing a, doing a movie shoot every day in my room. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. And um, the other thing I also want, you know, I know we talked about this beforehand, but like the other thing you, you mentioned something that that slider, for example, and how you use it to bring the camera closer to you in front of you. But if you think about, you know, the movies you watch, for example, and you've got somebody creeping up behind you, you know, sometimes what they will do is they'll take a camera operator and have them follow you. But mm -hmm. they also could just have a slider behind you 
and they've programmed it to where it's like, okay, the, the person's really close. And then they have to put the, you know, the hand reaching out, for example, is like the only element. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I would say this, if you've watched and, and Jim, you and I talk about this all the time and I always go back to this reference, television movies, you've watched these things lots and lots and even more because of pandemic, obviously, you know, use those as examples to help you learn. You know, just like Junaid talked about here, you know, about how he was watching, you know, uh, like YouTube videos, for example, or he was watching other people to see what they were doing, for example. Don't be afraid to reach out to some of those people as well if you're wondering, well, what kind of gear are they using? Because for the most part, it, it's going to go back to the same thing we always tell people, right, Jim? And that's just to ask because people love to talk about how they did something. They're very proud of their accomplishments, but people are afraid to ask them about those things. Um, so I really, I, I'm, I could geek out over this. I mean, just for quite a while. I mean, I just love, I love the setup you've got, you know, how you've, uh, you, I mean, you've got some really slick elements that help make your videos, your live streams or courses, pretty much even your basic zoom call, for example, mm -hmm. for work. I mean, little things that you can do to make things, uh, unique. Um, yeah. one other question I did have real quick. I mean, you talked about, you know, uh, you talk about like building this setup. So as far as a studio goes, like how big is that room that you have? You know, did you have like, a, is that like a, you know, uh, I don't know what the typical bedroom size is. Is that like a, a bedroom or is it like, Hey, I'm in a really small closet, but I've actually, you know, or am I in a garage? How, how do you, where are you set up at? Uh, so I'm in my basement. The room is 12 foot, four inches by 12 foot, three inches. Okay. Um, there is a little divot coming out in the corner that you don't see in the camera. Yeah. The set it up so if i were to move my camera just a tad bit that's oh, actually oh, look at this. Face coming out so it's like a like a little bump out over here yeah uh, so i basically covered that up it's kind of like my my shelf so that it's almost like a 10 foot by 10 foot room because the distance from this camera to that bookshelf is about 10 feet okay so in any in any room i the first thing that I ask, hey, how big a space are you working with? Because based on that space, we'll have to figure out what lens we're going to use. Because if you pick a lens that's 24 millimeters or 16 millimeters or 40 millimeters, it's going to depend on that camera uh, angle, the 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 view of um, what's that word? So the re <laughs> here's another reason why why I have posted notes over here so i can look over to them and talk about what i'm what i'm thinking about um it's going to have different angles on that camera lens the the longer the focal length the smaller that angle is going to be the larger the focal length sorry I mean, the larger the focal length the smaller the angle the shorter the focal length the wider the angle and that's why they call them wide angle lenses because you know they're they're used for uh, photography and landscape photography. Nice. Very nice. Anything else you have for any questions, uh, additional questions, Jem, for Janaid? No, I think this has been amazing. We may have to have him back in the future. Maybe we'll dive a little bit more into some of the things he does. I mean, I know he's got, uh, you know, we didn't even get into his, uh, you know, he's the ATEM Mini to, to do some of that switching. Yeah. Uh, do, do you also have a stream deck, Janaid? I do have a stream deck that I haven't masterfully set up yet. Right. Like, okay. Still in the box, right? No, it's it's it connected, but I don't use it as often as other people do. Yeah. Right. Awesome. I'm getting there. Yeah, Jim, I think we need to have him back. We need to have an advanced episode as well because, you know, again, I mean, we don't want to we don't want to overwhelm our viewers and our listeners because remember, you want to start with what you have. And then you want to level things up, and you know there is there are quite a bit of uh, there's quite a bit of planning that also needs to be involved in that as well. Um, I, I got to say, I still I'm enamored by the the dual backgrounds that you've done. I mean, you basically if you think about it, if you've got a square room, um, you could have four different scenes, mm -hmm. even though you're only in the same room. So uh, really cool. So I, I just have one last question for you, and this is the, the standard one, but like, where can people connect with with you? Sure, uh, people can connect with me in several different places, but I would like you to go to homestudiomastery.com or if you want to listen to the podcast, check out hacksandhobbies.com. 
Fantastic. So I want to thank everybody for joining us, uh, especially Junaid, uh, for joining us for episode 54 of the Launch Your Live podcast, where we discussed how to take your home studio to the next level with Junaid Ahmed. So remember, hey guys, if you want to uh, get help with your live streams, contact Gemini for consultation by messaging us through our Facebook page at Launch Your Live. And for more information on this particular episode, go to launcher.live forward slash EP54. We'll see you all on a future episode. Thanks a lot for tuning in.